Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and in this episode I'll be talking you through how I made this delightful artwork here and talking about the competitions Stay Safe and Stay Creative from Team Group with some pretty big amazing prizes that you might be interested in. More about that in just a moment. This video is split into chapters for easy watching and if you like what I do then check out the playlist on my channel and the links in the description for lots of courses which will help you unleash your creative potential. So first of all, what's all this about a competition with amazing prizes I hear you ask? So I was sponsored to be a demonstration creator for the upcoming competition by Team Group which is Stay Safe, Stay Creative, and it's a wallpaper design contest with some pretty amazing prizes. This is their site with all the information you need. You can see the contest theme there, which again, Stay Safe, Stay Creative. There's me, that handsome chappy there, and there's my beautiful artwork. If we scroll down further, you can see the fantastic prizing. First prize is a creator PC worth $3,000 with T-Create and Pro Art components. And you can see the components there, looks pretty powerful to me. The second prize is still pretty amazing, a motherboard, SSD and RAM from ProArt and T-Create. And there's a voters special award and all you have to do is vote for your favourite artwork and you get to join this raffle. And you can win some SSDs and RAM. If you scroll down further you can see the contest system with the deadlines, submission date being the 30th of April, so bear that in mind. And you can see that you need to submit your artwork in two forms, one for mobile and one for PC. And you can see the other rules and constraints there. Scroll down a bit further and you can see how to submit. So Facebook or Instagram and make sure you tag Team Group with the hashtag TCWD2021. So that's the competition. Here's the artwork that I created and I'll talk you through how I made this. My idea was two boys that are being very creative but obviously they're staying safe by defending their fort with gusto and doing it fairly creatively with their cardboard cutout swords and shields and bow and arrow and all sorts. So you can see them having fun there. So the very first thing that I do is get lots of references and ideas. So I'll look and uh, get ideas from Pinterest mainly, ArtStation, and just generally on the internet, and just generally in life, films, magazines, and that sort of thing. Once I get those ideas together in my head, then I start planning them out by drawing them out like this. And I'm using Critter here, which is a free drawing program, so you can learn about that on my channel, and you can learn how to draw with my new course, Learn How to Draw Creating Game Art. And it's a complete beginner's guide to drawing and creating images, much like this really. It is very advantageous to be able to quickly draw out some ideas. It will save you a lot of heartache in the program when you come to do the actual design. It's so much easier to create your 3D objects if you have some sort of reference to go by. And you can see I drew out the tree house and then I drew out this child that's sort of got a sword and crown and shield uh, with a silly cape and uh, based everything upon these ideas. And you can see I've just sort of drawn out the dog there, more to give me a reference saying, yep, it's a good idea to put a dog in, because <laughs> who doesn't love dogs? So I built the tree using the skin modifier technique, I talk more about that on my channel, and it's a great way of, well, in this case creating trees, but I always use it as a base mesh for sculpts as well. I find it the fastest way to make a base mesh, uh, most of the time anyway, it does depend on the object. Um, but like I say, you can see more about that on my channel. And basically I'm blocking in the main shape. So obviously getting the child in, the shape of the tree house, uh, the tree itself, and a few bushes later on. And you can see I'm being very simplistic with the model of the child. Uh, just really basic and I'll pose them later on and do a bit of sculpting on them later on, but very basic sculpting. Um, most of the detail I'll be adding by doing some hand painting. Uh, so it's just basic shapes that you need if you're going to paint on top of them. The things like the ropes and the railings and uh, the rope ladder, um, most of that I decided in the end to use uh, modeling by curves uh, and then convert it to a mesh afterwards. Uh, but you can see for the tire swing I was doing that with just a cylinder. Um, there's, there's different ways of doing it and each have their pluses and minuses and it's really it's generally what works for you. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to do these things. When you're modeling these sort of scenes, I think it's quite important to add some sort of variation to your models. Don't have them too uniform and sort of rigid. For the bike, you can see that I started to use curves at this point. I just thought it was going to be easier and quicker. There's a lot of different individual pieces in this model, so it did take me a long time, quite a good few hours um, over the span of about three days. So for that reason, I was trying to speed things up wherever I could, so modeling with curves in this 
particular instance seemed a good idea to speed things up. And I'm just overlapping the shapes, they don't really need to be modelled perfectly. And for this sort of low poly game art style uh, that I've got going on here, it wasn't too important to be completely realistic, I could sort of represent objects in that sort of low poly style. Now there's some bits like the top of this tree which I changed my mind on, but I'm keeping them in just so you can see the sort of whole process of what I'm doing. And in fact this was my second attempt uh, at doing a piece of artwork. I started doing a sort of hand painted, without completely outside of Blender, a hand painted piece, and it just really wasn't working for me so I just completely scrapped that and went for a different idea. It did cost me a lot of time though, I spent a few days on the other piece, but I wouldn't change that because it was quite a good useful experience, I learnt a lot whilst I was painting it. I was really trying to experiment with light and shade and uh, stylized art. And really I don't do that many finished pieces 2D, I usually do lots in 3D and even then it's more sort of tutorials so it's sort of basic stuff and it's nice to have an opportunity to actually have a go at producing something that I'm really proud of. So I just didn't feel comfortable with the final result from my 2D work so I thought right I'll go across to what I really know well which is 3D stuff and hand painted and just produce something. Uh, that's, I don't know, it just seemed a bit more fun what I was doing here than what I was trying earlier. I was trying to sort of cyberpunk theme of someone doing some graffiti and it just didn't quite work out. It's sometimes a very hard decision to make that when you decide to just scrap a piece or uh, start again and start anew. It's really sort of wrenching because you've spent so much time but it's always good to just think about it in terms of experience and growth. So you can see now with this model that I'm starting to refine the shapes a bit. I've got generally everything in there that I want to a degree and I've got the sort of main shapes outlined. I can go in and start adding a bit of detail. The main character here being the most important so I thought I'd spend a little bit of time sorting him out. I'm doing a sort of remesh approach to modeling here so quickly sort of sculpting, remeshing and not going too d detailed in terms of the resolution. Uh, so trying to keep everything fairly simple so I can draw on it nice and easily later on. And you can kind of see what's going on there. The hands for example, really simple, uh, just a thumb kind of sticking out in the fist and even the shoes just sort of a bit blobby and simple but it all works-ish in the end. A lot of the time you have to consider how close you're going to get to the subject. I knew that this was only a 2D piece although I do show it in 3D at the beginning of this video and probably at the end of the video. The main focus was actually as a 2D piece, so I could set up my camera angle and render it from a certain distance. So there's no point in adding lots of detail where it's not necessary. Having said that, there's a fine line I suppose between lacking in detail and too much detail, and a lot of the time it's best to go overboard rather than uh, going under in terms of the amount you do. Here I'm creating some hair and I'm sort of extracting from a mask, that's a nice way to create uh, usually hair but also sometimes clothing as well. Most of the techniques I use is just simple box modeling. Obviously I'm using the skin modifier in places. I tend to steer clear of things like array modifiers as well where, um, so things like the bunting where I had lots of different triangles along a line. It probably would have made more sense to put that in an array but in fact I find the array modifier a little bit annoying at times so <laughs> I tend to, tend to steer clear of it to be honest. And I like the uh, non-uniformity that you get without things like uh, the array modifier. Uh, you can see that I'm rigging my character here and uh, there was a funny error that I kept getting when I tried to actually make my uh, rig because I'm using Rigify and you can generate a rig from it that's uh, got um, inverse kinematics which is a little bit easier to um, position uh, but it kept going wrong and uh, it, Rigify is a bit of a pain like that if you accidentally deleted something that you shouldn't have uh, you can't generate your rig and it's a bit of a pain. Uh, it, you can sort it out but I just thought oh, I'll just go for FK I'm running out of time as always uh, so I just need to get these things done. Uh, so with the younger brother I thought make them a bit smaller but head the same size because then they're sort of looking quite cute and uh, slightly different clothes so modeling some different clothes there and he's gonna have a bow and arrow this time. I felt just one character probably wasn't enough and the thought of two brothers together sort of facing the world seemed a bit more I don't know just artistically it worked. <laughs> it's a fair bit of extra work though to put another character in so we've got to rig them and sculpt them and so forth so it was a bit of a pain and again quite time consuming but it's all really good fun again it's tricky isn't it because you're, you've you got these time limits you've got to put on yourself and you do really have to do that you have to say right I'm only going to spend two days on this um, or whatever it might be usually goes over always goes over in fact but it's that tricky thing as artists to uh, not go as 
detailed, as big and extravagant as you really want to and limit yourself because of time constraints. So wherever possible I tend to really go for it and just put that extra effort in, spend a bit more time. It's nice because we get to do things we really love and it's an enjoyable process even if it is a bit of a headache at times. <laughs> But all the time I think to myself, well, I'm working on something that's making me a better artist, so it's well worth doing. I'm going into sculpt mode with the tree now, this is quite good fun, so I apply all the modifiers and things and then uh, remesh it and start going in and doing some fun stuff to that. And it's, I do like doing organic shapes like this, it's very sort of, it's something quite uh, soothing about it where you're just sort of uh, creating the bark and all that sort of thing. I much prefer organic shapes to hard, hard surface modelling. I think just a moment ago we saw Critter jump up and uh, you saw me planning out the, um, the top of the fort uh, and I do that quite often, go back to my reference images, take a break from things, go and have a look at other people's artwork and my uh, designs that I planned and modify them and adapt them. And you can see here I'm changing the bike design, I just thought there was a bit sort of adult looking, uh, so a bit more kids bike uh, made more sense, so it's sort of towards a BMX style. The sword I kept nice and simple because it's supposed to be a sort of cardboard cutout. Um, it, I suppose it could have been a sort of wooden cutout or something like that um, because it's quite thick. But uh, it's the artistic license, you can kind of make your own mind up what it is. Uh, just sorting out all the curves here. Uh, it was a bit of a pain. Again, probably should have used the array modifier, but it doesn't. You have to go in and sort of change it around to make it look more organic. I always think anyway, otherwise it looks really rigid and not so nice. Uh, it, always when I'm box modeling uh, symmetrical shapes uh, use the mirror modifier where you can it will save you a lot of time so obviously the bow is symmetrized uh, two ways <laughs> in the z-axis and the x-axis in this particular case uh, using the curve, uh, curve modifier where possible and just box modeling these things out and uh, as I'm going along sort of adapting them uh, making them mo look more organic uh, worn and all those sort of things I suppose when you get to this stage of a piece you can think oh it's, it's starting to work and I was quite pleased with how it was coming together so it becomes a bit more relaxing at that point especially as I uh, tried my other piece and it didn't really work for me um, I was kind of getting a bit worried that I wasn't going to produce anything and, you know you always have those sort of nagging feelings inside you kind of saying it's never going to be good enough and all that sort of thing well once you get past a certain point you can start relaxing a bit and really sort of express yourself through the art. Uh, before that sometimes it can be a little bit stilted and uh, worrying and stressful. So yes, all artists go through that sort of thing I suppose. Now with the dog I'd already made a low poly beagle so I reused that. It's a really good idea to reuse art where you can so if you've already created something don't bother creating it a few times. Not that you should go out of your way to reuse things, it's kind of that happy marriage between originality but also time management. The cool thing about Rigify is that it's got different rigs that you can use so it's got a dog rig in there so I just plonked that in and uh, pushed it around until I got the position I liked. It's supposed to be sort of uh, a lot of movement to it so he's sort of uh, jumping up a little bit and barking that sort of thing. Not sure how I messed the dog's mesh up but I did somehow. Um, I think I didn't have clipping turned on with a mirror or something like that. Um, but you can go in, once you've rigged something you can go in and add a shape key to it and that can sometimes sort out all the pinching that's going on when you rig things and like pinching in the arms especially when you bend them and stuff like that. So adding shape keys can be quite a useful thing. In terms of workflow when I'm doing this sort of thing and project management I'm always uh, saving uh, with a new number so uh, in Blender you can go uh, save, save as and then just put it click on the little plus icon uh, and then you can add one to the number of the save. Uh, that way you've always got uh, several sort of versions you can go back to if something goes wrong. I think that's quite important really and having backups as well, I've said that before in the past, although I'm not running this with a backup at the moment which is a bit naughty, <laughs> but uh, in between backup systems. Really bad idea that when you're doing professional work, uh, so don't take my example there. <laughs> So I think I might have missed a chunk of the texture painting there. Um, so you can see that I'm going around texture painting now. Uh, I've unwrapped most of the things onto one texture, one 4K texture and just going around painting. And I split it up later on because the faces needed a bit more detail so I just give them a different texture. And it's nice not to have to worry about texture space, texture sizes, because this isn't going off into a game engine which is uh, what I'm usually used to. I had a kind of glitchy problem in Blender actually. I'm using version 9.2 
and it was a pain. Uh, so I'm trying to bake lots of things onto one map and it just didn't want to work for me. Uh, and that is really glitchy if you're trying to get lots of objects, lots of separate objects um, onto one texture map. Um, so I had to kind of keep rebaking every now and again. Uh, but uh, once I did actually bake them out, uh, then I kind of smooth it out because once you've got the bake and I'm baking from cycles so I can have all the shadows and things like that um, already sort of, like I say, baked in there. Uh, it makes it just a lot quicker so I don't have to draw the shadows in. But you do have to do a fair bit of tidying up because uh, cycles is quite grainy. So when you zoom in, you can see all that graininess and you just need to use the smudge tool and smudge it out a little bit. Uh, and it helps sort of break the surface up a bit as well. In the highlights, I'm trying to go off and make them warmer and in the shadows, I'm making them cooler. Warmer and cooler meaning uh, warm colors being the sort of yellows and reds and the cool colors being the blues. So they're opposite, opposite sides of the color wheel. And it's nice if you can uh, use those in your shadows and uh, and highlights, uh, but always go the opposite. So if you've got highlights that are blue, you go the opposite, and highlights that are uh, warm, you go the opposite. Um, it doesn't matter which way around they are. Uh, generally, people have warm highlights and uh, cool uh, shadows, generally speaking. See, I'm adding in some details in the faces, and you can see also that I've uh, got a new map for this. So I uh, created a new one just so I had more UV texturing space. Otherwise, it becomes quite pixelated, and it was too pixelated. It took me a long time to get the expression right. It just wasn't working for me for some reason, so I kept sort of adjusting it and pulling it around. Uh, it only needed to be kind of uh, suggestive. It didn't need to be really detailed, uh, but it was still problematic for some reason. I think the, the shape underneath was a little bit awkward and I hadn't sculpted it very well and I probably should have put a bit more detail in there, but it worked out all right in the end after a bit of an adaptation. Not so sure about the younger brother's mouth looking at it now. Um, I don't really ever get that close in so you can't really see it. Uh, and that, I think that was a bit of a downside of the design is that the boys don't stand out against the background particularly well and I did try um, with lots of effort to make them stand up further and it was tough. It's all right when the camera's moving but when it's still it's not great and that's possibly something that uh, not as a natural 2D artist and more coming from a 3D background you don't worry quite as much about those sort of th things because you've got the camera motion with animation um, so things tend to sort of pop out from the background with that movement. But when you're doing 2D, you need uh, to kind of uh, think more about that compositionally. And uh, it, was, it was a tough one to get that working because obviously you've got the brown natural color of the tree house and the fort. Um, but uh, for some reason, the boys weren't really standing out against that. And every time I lightened the boys up, it just looked a bit unnatural and odd. Um, later on, I do some uh, compositing uh, within Critter and Photoshop, I can't remember which one now, uh, but uh, um, I go in and sort of brighten them up a bit and try and make them pop out a little bit more. But it's a little bit confusing in that area, uh, which was a frustration. It's interesting at this point, I'm going around uh, painting different things and it's quite time consuming as you can imagine. I'm trying to try a different style from what I'm used to. I go uh, fairly sort of stylized and in a sense detailed. Uh, whereas here I'm trying to be a bit more abstract uh, to give it that sort of, I don't know, a bit more creative style really. Uh, so this wood, you can see they're sort of like streaky lines rather than actual sort of wood designs which are stylized from my, let's say, Atlas Empires work that I've been doing. Um, so there's, it's quite a different approach and it's fun to try these things out. It's nice to be able to take part in a competition, that's why I kind of agreed to this, to um, just do something different, uh, try things out. Obviously it's still my hand painted style that I do regularly, uh, but uh, trying out uh, and pushing yourself, it's important to enter competitions such as this uh, in order to give yourself a challenge like that and to allow yourself to move in a different direction. In some ways I'm not too sure about the rope, I was kind of rushing that bit and trying to uh, not do it too detailed but uh, uh, be sort of free and creative and it turned out okay. Uh, I think it looks a little bit like a stripy snake rather than a rope though. <laughs> Now at this point I was still having fun but I was aware of the time and I'd gone way over the time I'd allotted for this uh, whole piece and uh, uh, it starts getting a little bit stressful at that point. I suppose for me I just put in more time in the evenings and uh, it's nice enough that I haven't got you know another job to do or something. I suppose I've got different contracts to do but uh, no uh, specific uh, job 
that I have to go off to nine to five sort of thing. So I can just think, right, this evening I'm not going to relax. I'm just going to keep going with this um, so I can find time. But um, it must be hard for those people who are trying to fit these things in around work. So the hobbyists I'm thinking about, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of hobbyists watch my channel, you see. And I get lots of questions about uh, trying to break into the industry and still doing a, um, a nine to five job as well as doing this at home in the evening. So it can be quite tough. Uh, so I, I, I've been there <laughs> and now I'm doing this full time. It's a lovely position to be in that I can just think, right, this evening I'll just spend a bit more time doing it. And doing something you love is fantastic, really. Now, I did have a kind of color palette in mind. You can see there's sort of that um, organic, uh, natural brown and greens, but I sort of had hints of purple in there. You can see in the tree design, uh, there are sort of hints of purple coming out. Uh, but uh, trying to be a little bit free with the colors, not to uh, keep it too rigid. But I do like it when artists really go for it with one color theme. So they've got just a, a couple of colors that they really go to town with. And obviously they're using the color colors around it so if they're using a red then there's lots of uh, sort of pinks and um, and slight yellows and oranges in there but uh, if they go with one theme it looks really cool so um, I kind of wanted to do that to start off with but it didn't really suit it it needed to be a bit colorful uh, to suggest creativity that's what I was thinking anyway I did eventually give it sort of a more evening look uh, so those of you that know about photography will know the golden hour so that's a nice time to shoot uh, photographs and it's that warm glow you get uh, around the evening time where the sun's quite low and it's uh, sort of long shadows. And yeah, it gives it that sort of orangey look. I felt uh, lots of the um, big shapes like the tree top and the bushes needed breaking up. So I did create some leaves. As you can see, I'm sort of breaking up uh, the silhouettes and outlines uh, with those leaves. And I think that helps it. I could have possibly put more of those in. Um, it's a bit of a pain actually moving them around. I mean, you can use particle systems for that and hair systems, uh, but I wanted to be able to position them myself, uh, but that is very time consuming. Uh, particle systems work fine, but uh, it's just a, a bit of a pain when you have to sort of weight paint. That doesn't always go exactly where you want it to, so uh, often I just end up positioning them, uh, like I say, positioning them myself. Uh, slowly starting to get there with this, and you can see uh, it's sort of coming to life a bit more. Uh, and hopefully you can see that um, there is sort of an abstract look to it rather than a sort of, um, I suppose there is a stylized element to it, but not the traditional uh, Clash of Clans stylized element uh, that I'm usually sort of heading towards with some of my um, hand painted styles. So it's around this point that I start thinking about the HDRI that I'm going to put in. So I go to HDRI Haven, grab one. I think it was an evening type one. Uh, so it's got that sort of orangey look. Uh, then once I've composited it slightly within Blender, I go across to Critter to just finish a few things off. And you can see me putting in some clouds in the background. And so I just start with a sort of orange and blue, uh, which is the main sort of uh, light and dark of my image anyway and then just start sort of smudging some clouds in there which is quite fun uh, then I go in and add a layer of dodge and burn so lighten areas up and darken areas uh, that's quite a sort of fun process um, before I did that I re-exported my image because I wanted to brighten up some of the leaves that were sort of uh, floating around the place they were with a particle system so they're just sort of thrown in there but this is what I was talking about earlier, about lightening areas up and darkening areas within the 2D program, just to make things pop and stand out. And you can kind of see me flicking the layer on and off there and then warming up the sky, putting a bit of uh, dodge, color dodge there uh, to just make things seem more, I suppose, mystical in the end. <laughs> And there we go, there's the final image. I'm really pleased with how it turned out. I think it really works. Um, there's obviously more that could be done and you have to limit yourself with time in the end, don't you? But uh, yeah, really good fun. I'm very glad and thankful for the sponsorship opportunity from Team Group because it's nice to really go for it with a piece like this. And so uh, very pleased with how it all turned out. I, I did the animation, as you can see here. I probably went a little bit overboard with color correction, I think. Uh, maybe I'll have to go back and look at it. Maybe you won't be seeing what I'm seeing, but it's probably a little bit too saturated. Although that's kind of fun as well. It gives it that sort of, I don't know, comic, cartoon, uh, almost Disney style in some ways. You can also see what I mean about the um, characters standing out a bit more when the camera's moving and that's kind of more what I'm used to being able to move around your images so it does help when you've got uh, a 3D program like this to be able to do those sort of things. So once again thanks to Team Group do check out the competition and see for yourself the wonderful prizes on offer 
Thanks for watching, well done to all those that got this far through the video. I hope you enjoyed the process and I'll see you next time.